So we've got lots of people with us from lots of different countries. It's really nice to uh, see people here again today. And I think uh, we can start. So I would like to introduce you to Nadine. So Nadine Early is our academic director in ATC Language Schools. And she has been in the uh, English language education industry for over 20 years. She has a master's degree in ling linguistics from Trinity College Dublin. And she has been delivering in-service training and pre-service training to teachers uh, within ATC uh, for many years on a variety of different areas within the sector, um, including CLIL, which she's focusing on today. But other uh, subjects that she's trained on are language skills and systems development, task-based teaching and learning, uh, developing learning strategies, and uh, if you've been to her previous webinar, you'll see that she does a lot on um, supporting teaching and learning, for example, helping students with their vocabulary. So today, Nadine is going to talk to us about developing cognitive academic language proficiency. And this is also known as CALP. So in this webinar, Nadine will explore the relationship between language and Cognition. She'll look at the types of cognitive skills students need to develop and the general academic language required to develop these skills and demonstrate their learning through English. So now I'm going to hand over to Nadine and uh, uh, I'll let you take over. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you, Joanne. That's great. Thank you. You've introduced my uh, topic for me, so I don't have to do that now. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't have to say this. Um, very difficult mouthful cognitive academic language proficiency it's awful otherwise known uh, as CALP and hmm, I'm not too fond of CALP either I tend to call it just quite simply the uh, the language of learning <clears throat> or indeed language for learning so uh, the content of this webinar today, so we're going to look um, at the language of learning. We're going to, I'm going to endeavor to answer the following questions. What is the language of learning? How can we draw learners' attention to it? How can we help them uh, practice it? And how can we support them using it? Now, before we uh, move on, I just want to establish something with you. So uh, throughout this webinar, you will hear me refer to L1 and L2. So just so that everybody is clear, L1 is the first language, also known as the mother tongue. And this is the dominant language of the group. Now, of course, we all know it's not necessarily the first language of every student in the class, but it is the dominant first language of, of the class. <clears throat> L2, on the other hand, is uh, the second language, or for some students, the third or even fourth language, but for the majority, the second language. It is the target language of the lesson. It is the language of instruction and the target language in a CLIL context. So that's what I, uh, I, I'd be referring to when I, when I talk about students and teachers, L1 and L2. <clears throat> So what is the language of learning? Well, to progress through the, uh, the school curriculum, now we're talking about secondary students here, not primary students, secondary students, so teenagers. And to progress through the school curriculum, students need <clears throat> basic language skills and they need academic language skills. So basic language skills are sometimes referred to as BICs or basic interpersonal communicative skills. And this is the ability to use language for social or conversational purposes. This is the language that students are taught in foreign language lessons. Academic language skills often referred to as CALP. And this is the ability to use language to be successful within their curriculum subjects. This is the language of school or the language of learning. 
Now, all students need this language, not just those studying in, uh, in a CLIL context. So what does the language of CALP or the language of learning consist of? <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> well, broadly, it consists of what we call subject specific language or uh, key words um, and general academic language. Now, subject specific language are the key words which are uh, crucial to uh, an understanding of the subject, but which are only really used in that subject. And so they're low frequency. They don't crop up very often. And um, usually they don't even crop up anywhere outside of the subject itself. And they're high precision. They're very, very precise. They have one very precise uh, technical meaning. And here are some examples from different subjects. Uh, general academic language, uh, this constitutes the, uh, the language which we use to deal with all uh, subject specific concepts across the curriculum. Uh, it's not specific to one subject, but it's very, very important for learning. So look at this uh, definition here from biology. What is protoplasm? It's a definition of protoplasm. So the words in blue here are uh, key words, subject specific, specific to biology. Um, but these red words here, these are the general academic words, which are crucial to this definition. Without knowing these words, this definition becomes a lot more difficult to uh, articulate. So general academic language can be described as the language we use to engage in the thinking or cognitive processes that we use when we learn. So here are some typical examples. This is just a sample. Obviously, there are very, very many more. And general academic language also includes non-academic, very general concepts, concepts we use and communicate about frequently in a general non-academic uh, context or situation. And language teachers will recognize here the, the language of these concepts as the language that is often worked on in the language classroom. And this language is also important for helping students understand and express uh, academic concepts too. So students need to understand and use subject specific vocabulary and general academic language. Now, the focus of today's webinar is on general academic language. I won't be addressing the subject of subject specific vocabulary today, although I will come to this uh, later on in, in another webinar. So students need this general academic language to demonstrate an understanding of concepts and to express a range of thinking skills. However, Often this language is not taught in L2 medium classrooms or in L1 medium classrooms. So in the L2 medium classroom, teachers can be overly focused on the, uh, the key words and not give the general academic language the attention that it needs. While in the L1 classroom, uh, it is assumed that students, well, they already have this language, so there's no need to focus on it. And so it is not taught. Uh, I read once of a, um, a study in the UK. Now, I'm sorry, I can't cite this study because I can't remember where I read it, but uh, a study in the UK where subject teachers teaching in the L1 
um, were asked to identify the language of their subjects, the language they believed their students needed. Um, and the study found that the majority of teachers identified only the subject specific vocabulary as being the language of their subjects. And when asked, most were not able to identify the general academic language, even though it was in their L1, their mother tongue. So we can assume, I think, that if teachers don't know it, then students certainly don't know it. But students need this language because language and thinking, they go together. Language, it brings about learning. Language and learning cannot be separated. Language structures enable us to construct meaning. So teachers, they must collaborate on teaching the language of learning. Uh, so for example, subject teachers, history, geography, maths, whatever, subject teachers might present the language teacher with a list of subject specific vocabulary. And the language teacher then can help the subject teachers with uh, pronunciation of, of difficult terms, uh, with constructing definitions, nice, good, clear definitions, and uh, by developing activities to present and practice and consolidate uh, key words. But subject teachers should also uh, present uh, the texts and tasks and intended learning outcomes to the language teacher. So, for example, uh, in this text, uh, students will be reading about cause and effect. Or in this task, uh, students will have to form and state a hypothesis. And the language teachers then will need to provide the language patterns needed to engage in these thinking skills. So a language teacher needs to convey, uh, for example, the idea uh, that the concept of cause and effect is embedded in conditional sentences or hypothesis in modality in using uh, modal verbs, for example. So what are these uh, thinking skills or processes that I've been talking about? Well, they are the cognitive processes our brains use when we think or when we learn. So we expect or we hope that our learners will progress from very uh, concrete thinking skills, such as identifying and organizing information, uh, where they'll ask questions uh, such as, you know, what, when, where, which, who, how many, to more abstract thinking skills, such as reasoning and hypothesizing where we want them to ask and answer questions such as why and what if. So students need to progress in these skills as they move through their curriculum, but even as they move through a single lesson or even a single uh, activity or task. So these thinking skills are often categorized into uh, higher order thinking skills or HOTS as we call them and lower order thinking skills or LOTS. And we use LOTS to remember information, to order information, define objects, check understanding and review learning. Whereas we use HOTS or higher order thinking skills to develop reasoning skills, to develop inquiry and discussion, to develop creative thinking, to evaluate our work and the work of others, and to, uh, for example, hypothesize about what could happen. So I'm sure most of you will recognize this. This is Bloom's taxonomy, which is a nice, uh, simple classification system used to uh, define and distinguish different levels of human cognition. Um, and there are six levels in this taxonomy. 
the original taxonomy was developed in 1956 by Benjamin Bloom, and he was an educational psychologist at the University of Chicago. And this is uh, an adaptation of, of that original taxonomy. This uh, is a, quite a recent adaptation, and this is the one in common use today. And it provides a neat way to organize thinking skills into uh, six levels from the most uh, basic down here, the lots and um, remember, can the student uh, recall uh, facts, concepts, information and um, understand, can the student um, explain the uh, information, the ideas and, and the concepts that they have remembered. Uh, apply. Can the student uh, use his knowledge and understanding of information in a new context or situation? And then we move up to the, the higher order uh, thinking skills up here. Uh, analyze. Students have to draw or make connections, make connections um, uh, between ideas, among ideas. Can they distinguish between different parts and understand how they are uh, connected or how they are uh, related. Um, evaluate students, uh, can the, it's their ability to critically appraise information. Can the student uh, justify an opinion or a decision and explain uh, which options are, are better than others and why? Um, and then the, the, the pinnacle of human thought, uh, create. Can the student build on all of these lower uh, skills in order to create or produce a new product or a new idea or work? So this, uh, this taxonomy is um, it's hierarchical, meaning that the learning at the higher levels is dependent on having uh, attained the knowledge at the lower levels. So how can we use the taxonomy? Uh, well, a good place to start is by looking at the types of things that students will need to do in order to engage with a particular thinking process. And these are often listed as action verbs. And a brief look online will bring up many uh, examples of these verb tables um, to help identify which action verbs align with each level in the taxonomy, in Bloom's taxonomy. So, of course, these, all of these verbs, and again, this is just a sample, there are more, um, but these verbs might be the starting point when developing uh, learning objectives or ta uh, setting tasks or asking questions. So here is a uh, table of action verbs for use by Irish um, art teachers at secondary level for the junior cycle. So in Ireland, we have two cycles at secondary level. The junior cycle, which is three years uh, long, students are about 13 to 15 years of age. Then they have one uh, transition year and then they go into their senior cycle, which is two years long. So this table comes from an organization which uh, supports uh, junior cycle teachers. So these are the uh, action verbs of the visual art process. So for each stage in the process, these are the uh, action verbs that might be used. And the uh, highlighted verbs are those that have been taken from the learning outcomes in the junior cycle visual art curriculum. So we'll recognize them as the type of thinking processes that turn up in the taxonomy. Demonstrate, discuss, justify, apply, consider, reflect, explain, uh, create, utilize, experiment, examine, investigate. Okay, consider, respond. Here's another one uh, from the same uh, organization. Uh, and this one is for junior cycle geography teachers. 
And here, the action verbs are given in red and they're listed uh, alphabetically. And each of these action verbs is defined for the teacher. So for example, um, classify, group things based on common characteristics. Distinguish, make the differences between two or more concepts or items clear. Now, while such tables are no doubt very helpful for L1 medium teachers to help them uh, clearly state learning objectives and have a principled approach to uh, questioning and designing tasks, those teaching in an L2 context need a little bit more, I think. They need to know what specific language they should use to turn these action verbs into relatable questions and task rubrics. Uh, but also, and importantly, they need to know what specific language they need to give their students so that the students can demonstrate their learning using these action verbs through a second language. So teachers need to be able to analyze these action verbs for their language so that they know what questions to ask and what answers to expect. So analyzing each of the verbs for the type of questions to ask or statements to make. So this is where the, uh, this is where language teachers really need to support subject teachers um, in, in analyzing and describing the language of these thinking processes. This language really should be analyzed on different levels, analyzed and described on different levels. So for example, on the level of vocabulary. So here for the cognitive skills of uh, predicting um, or describing cause and effect, we can give our learners very general language to express their thinking, or we can give them more precise language, such as these verbs that clearly embody the thinking process. The concept of prediction is embedded here and here in these verbs. And the concept of cause and effect is embedded here and here. Uh, we also need to analyze uh, language at the level of uh, phrases. So where we are uh, noticing and teaching whole phrases or chunks of language, which learners can then uh, with lots of practice and a bit of time can um, uh, automatically retrieve and use easily to express a concept, whole chunks. Uh, we can analyze it at, uh, we can and should analyze it at the level of connectors. So obviously we can help our students connect their ideas. And then, uh, you know, on the level of grammar, so what the constraints or, or rules are when constructing a clause. Um, you know, if you want to use a conditional clause such as this to express this idea of cause and effect, don't forget that you must follow the rule of if plus present, simple, will plus spare, infinitive. Okay. We should also become practiced in analyzing our texts. Um, we should become practiced in noticing and picking up on the useful phrases, uh, structures and patterns of general academic language. We should know what our text types are and what the language of those texts types might be. So here's a, a text taken from a, a CLIL uh, geography and history book on 
life in the Paleolithic age. And you can see that the key vocabulary of the topic um, has been highlighted for the students. So this is how it's presented in the book. The key vocabulary is um, highlighted in, in bold. However, there's, there's more in this text in terms of useful general academic language, language that can uh, help the, the students demonstrate their learning on this topic. So if a subject teacher, history teacher or geography teacher gives this text to a language teacher, he or she should be able to notice some of the nice patterns in this text, patterns that should also be highlighted and brought to the students' attention in addition to the key vocabulary. So we can, we can see in this text some nice uh, patterns for uh, describing uh, or defining. Uh, the purpose of this text is to describe uh, life in the Paleolithic age. So drawing students' attention to these language patterns is very helpful, it's useful. They get to see this language in context to understand that this is the, uh, the type of language which can be uh, expected in this type of text and begin to create a store of sentence models which again over time and with plenty of practice they should be able to automatically uh, retrieve and use in their own output. And of course, we should work on analyzing texts with our learners. We should train our learners in text analysis. It should become part of our classroom practice and part of strategy development. So here's a possible procedure for doing just that. So students learn to take a text and to ask, what is the purpose of this text? Who is the writer and who is the reader? Knowing who the writer is and who the intended reader is helps to uh, contextualize and understand the purpose of the text. And then this text is used as a model to show key language features of that particular text type. And then learners uh, and teacher work together to jointly construct uh, an example text in the same uh, type or the same genre using the same language patterns. And here, of course, the learners will be given lots of support with uh, sentence frames, which is something we'll come to in a while. Um, and then the learners move on to individual writing of the text type. Um, again, some support might be needed. And other texts uh, from the same genre are compared so that learners can think about and become aware and notice uh, similarities and differences in language and text structure. And then as teachers, when planning, we also need to analyze our lessons, our tasks and our activities so that we can identify the thinking processes uh, students will need to understand and express in English. Um, and of course, we uh, must work to help students identify them too. So again, this is where collaboration between the subject teacher and the language teacher is very important. So the subject teacher and the language teacher need to sit down together and for each topic they need to identify the thinking processes that the students will need to understand and use in English. And then for each thinking process create a list of example sentences on the topic. So here we have our uh, information technology teacher and our language teacher 
working together to think about the topic, the upcoming topic of output devices. These are the thinking process students will need to engage in throughout this topic. And these are a list of some, some example sentences for each uh, thinking process. So let's look at this uh, a little more closely. So uh, here are a list of uh, possible example sentences that our two imaginary teachers um, might come up with to demonstrate some of the thinking processes required to deal with the topic of output devices. So we have example sentences, uh, four of them here for defining. Uh, three sentences for classifying, comparing, showing consequence and predicting. So I have uh, highlighted in blue what we call the functional language in the sentences. That is the language patterns that tell the reader or listener which function or thinking process is being used. So I'm going to show you now, how are we doing for time? Yeah, we're okay. I'm going to show you now uh, three activities which can be used to help learners notice and identify these thinking processes and the functional language that might be used with them. So for demonstration purposes, we, uh, we're going to use this, these uh, and the topic of output devices, but sentences from any topic uh, within any subject can be used for these activities. Um, so for each of the three activities, the sentences need to be cut up so that we have uh, each example sentence on a, a single slip of paper. The functional language um, does not necessarily need to be highlighted at this stage. I just did this for you, uh, but we wouldn't necessarily highlight it at this stage of the activity. <clears throat> okay, so all three activities start in the same way, but then proceed in three different ways. And I'll go through each separately. So you start with writing on the board in the L1, the names of the thinking processes. Now, these must be written in the L1 because it is important that the concept is well established for the students. So for the purposes of demonstration here, the L1 will be Italian. And I do hope I got these right. <laughs> Okay, so we start by establishing the concept. We ask students for examples of how you might express each one of these in the L1. We're not looking for a sentence with this word in it, as we often do in language classes. We're just looking for an example sentence that demonstrates an understanding of what it is to define something. Um, then we provide uh, input um, uh, by giving students examples of uh, how you might express these in English. Now, then we move on. Okay, so here's activity one. We give small groups of students the English sentences on separate slips of paper and the names of the thinking processes in the L1 on different slips and students have to uh, match the processes to the sentence. So they gather all the sentences together and categorize them uh, under the different uh, thinking processes. Uh, with this activity, students, they have the written input to look at. So it encourages them to uh, look closely at the, uh, the language used and to notice the patterns that they can match language to function. So it's a nice activity.
Okay, here's activity number two. So you write the names <clears throat> of the thinking processes in the L1 on different little cards or slips of paper. And you give them out so that each student has one, one slip of paper. And then you, the teacher, you read out the sentences in jumbled order. And the student with the matching process calls it out. So with this activity, students have to listen for the, uh, the salient language, the relevant language of the function. <clears throat> And then activity three, you give each student one of the sentences in English on a slip of paper, and you call out one of the thinking processes in the L1. And the students with the matching English sentences read them out. So with this activity, students get good uh, oral practice. They get practice in uh, producing the language themselves orally. And then, of course, to consolidate all of this, students should be tasked with uh, writing another example on the same topic uh, for each language function for homework. So they get to see the language, to hear the language, and then to use the language in these uh, three activities. So these type of uh, consciousness raising activities <clears throat> are really important. And by consciousness raising, I mean activities that guide students towards an increased awareness of something, either language or a concept. Um, and we need to ensure that our students understand in both L1 and L2, the type of thinking that is required of them. Here's another activity. Uh, this one focuses uh, specifically on one cognitive process and that is defining. So again, this is one that can be used for any subject across the curriculum. Um, but for demonstration purposes, we're going to use the subject of information technology again. Okay, so this activity aims to help students learn uh, computing terms and their definitions. So their task is to match a list of given terms to the definitions. So the teacher maybe dictates the terms and invites the students up to the board uh, to write them in above the correct definition. Okay. But once again, looking beyond the key terms of this topic, uh, which is the, the, these computing terms, look at the wonderfully rich uh, language patterns for defining here in the input. So the next step then is to give the students uh, oral practice in these definitions. So first the teacher will go through each definition, making sure the students understand the definition using the L1 if necessary. And then the students repeat each definition after the teacher with a good focus on pronunciation and the chunking of language. The next stage in this activity then is to turn it into what we call a progressive deletion activity. And this type of activity is really, really good for helping students learn chunks of language through repetition. So what you do is you have all your sentences on the board and you rub out one part of a sentence, but not the key words. And students have to read all the sentences, including the one that has been rubbed out. OK, and then you rub out another one and repeat and another one and repeat and you repeat this uh, procedure until all the sentences have been rubbed out or deleted. 
and only the keywords are left. So students are now reading the definitions from memory rather than from the board. Students then have to write down the definitions from memory into their notebooks. And then once these definitions that they've written down from memory have been checked, students are then helped to uh, notice and highlight the patterns of useful language for defining. So students are made aware that this is general academic language that can be used uh, elsewhere to define or describe or explain things in other subjects. We just need to draw their attention to the patterns. So used as a something for something, a verbal noun or, or nouns. Uh, a method of, plus ing, using noun phrase. A uh, noun phrase such as list examples. A uh, noun phrase consisting of list uh, components. Uh, a device that present simple. So a language rich classroom will display these examples uh, of language, these patterns on the wall uh, for students reference to help them with their production of this language in their uh, speaking and writing. We can use these sentences to make sentence frames. Sentence frames are uh, models of construction uh, which are used to support learners in, in using the language. Uh, I heard uh, in, in a talk once um, of a teacher who, gave, uh, who gives her third level university students who are studying their degree programs through an L2, so a, a third level university CLIL essentially, um, these little key rings uh, with cards and uh, on each card she has uh, an academic language function with some example sentences or sentence frames for each one. So on one card, it might be a frame for describing, on another one for talking about a process, and another one uh, for talking about statistics, on another one for hypothesizing and, and so on. Um, and I thought that was a really nice idea. Handy, you know, students can keep it in their bag or on their key ring or whatever. So you can give as many or as few frames as you think necessary, depending on the age and linguistic uh, and or cognitive level of your students, um, or depending um, on the topic of your lesson or the theme of the week or the particular learning outcome you're focusing on at any given time. And of course, once they become well established and known to the students, they can and should be taken down off the wall because, you know, at some point we have to let go of their hands, right? Uh, and of course, you can differentiate um, and give different frames for uh, different learners. So you can differentiate with your sentence frames. And we can present frames um, along with uh, complete examples. <clears throat> but we should always be tuned into the patterns and work to make these patterns as explicit to learners as we can. Uh, for example, by using colour. 
So we have the green here. These are followed by the noun or the noun phrases, and these are followed by the verb. And here we have the effects here in, in purple, you know, cause and then effects. So we're using uh, color or whatever means we can, visual organizers is another way of doing it, to uh, make patterns as uh, explicit and noticeable as possible for our students. So uh, a couple of minutes left, and I just want to finish up now by um, looking at how we can help our learners through the types of task that we set. So in their book, uh, Doing Task-Based Teaching, Dave and Jane Willis outline the seven most common types of classroom tasks uh, and then they categorize them according to the cognitive processes that learners engage in when they are carrying out these tasks. Okay, and here we go. This is them. Okay, so listing uh, is a way of gathering ideas together in a, in a linear way. Uh, ordering and sorting involves putting information in sequence, in order, or classifying information into different categories. Uh, matching then involves uh, making decisions about what information goes with other information, how things relate to each other. Um, comparing involves analysis and perhaps evaluation. Uh, problem solving invites learners to, to analyze, to examine, to evaluate, to select, to hypothesize, to predict. Um, and then to offer advice and recommendations. Uh, sharing personal experiences or storytelling. And um, this is very useful for the development of learners' uh, BICs, their basic interpersonal communicative skills. But it does have some relevance in an academic context too, as uh, personalization is often used to uh, contextualize content and consolidate learning. What is your experience of this or has this ever happened to you or somebody that you know? And then of course uh, projects and creative tasks involve many of the other task types in, uh, in the process. So you know listing problems, uh, ordering, uh, ordering them or classifying them, maybe comparing different options as a solution and, and so on. So Willis and Willis uh, call this the task generator and they recommend teachers use it as a starting point for developing tasks once they have decided on a topic. Um, many of these activity types will be familiar to language teachers and they work very well for general topics but also for subject topics. And this is another area I think where language teachers and subject teachers can collaborate. Um, so let's look very quickly at just a couple of ideas. We obviously don't have time to go through them all um, but we'll just look at a couple of ideas. Uh, so listing, well listing is the simplest type of task. On the face of it, it's one of the least cognitively demanding. Um, however, a simple listing task can demand more from students, cognitively and linguistically. So, excuse me, <coughs> if we move from uh, listing types, to uh, listing features, we can see the shift in the demand of the students, both cognitively and linguistically. So cognitively students now have to apply their knowledge of type to outline the features, identify and describe the features. And linguistically, we're moving on from a simple list of nouns to uh, nouns um, and adjectives and uh, maybe, you know, some prepositional phrases. If we ask students to shift from listing features to listing reasons, we can see the cognitive and linguistic jump uh, required here. So 
cognitively students now have to draw connections between ideas and compare and contrast and linguistically we can expect more complex sentences like a, a list of sentences for example with uh, comparative adjectives and then uh, finally if we ask students to list uh, recommendations we are demanding yet more of them so cognitively now students have to appraise and critique justify their their opinion and uh, linguistically we can expect uh, you know uh, a list of ideas containing language for making recommendations for example modal verbs or passive voice etc so we can see that even within the same topic which is the topic of transport uh, and with the same task type listing we can build and we can build many other uh, cognitive and so linguistic requirements into the task design. Um, ordering and uh, sorting. So the types of tasks described by Willis and Willis are the types of tasks that uh, should be focused on in the foreign language classroom where the language of Bix and Kalp can come together with students' attention being brought to this. So ordering and sorting uh, tasks, these are commonly used in the foreign language classroom, um, but they should focus not just on the end product, but also on the process of getting there um, and the language needed for that process. So here, this is not just about creating a story or getting events in, in the right order, but also about the interactions that are uh, verbalized along the way and the learning that takes place at that time. So uh, with functional language uh, for BICS, um, when, when it can be transferred to, to, to CALP, uh, this should also be drawn to students' attention. So most foreign language teachers will recognize this type of task, uh, where students have to sequence steps in a process. So although the keywords will be different, the uh, language for describing the steps in a process will be the same. And finally, uh, problem solving tasks. These are great to do with uh, higher level learners, those with a higher level L2 competency at least. Um, they invite learners to offer advice and recommendations on problems, giving great opportunities to develop uh, the thinking skills of evaluation. Um, but in order to do this, they will have to engage in uh, many cognitive skills across the lots and hots along the way, from uh, identifying, describing and explaining to interpreting, solving, relating, comparing, uh, selecting and critiquing. So to organize a problem solving activity for learners, it's a good idea to break the task down into a series of steps or mini tasks. Because if you look at any one of these stages, you can see the cognitive and the linguistic demands of the students. But keep in mind, if the cognitive demand of the problem is too high, learners will have less capacity, less mental capacity for uh, composing what it is they want to say. So it's very important when doing these type of tasks to give them lots of support and to give them lots of time. Time to uh, think about and prepare a solution, but also time to think about and prepare how they are going to articulate that solution and report back on it. So time is very important. Okay, to sum up, uh, to help learners develop uh, cognitive academic language proficiency, language and uh, 
subject teachers should work together to analyze the language demands of the subject. This will include subject specific vocabulary and general academic language. General academic language can be found in the language we use to engage in lower order and higher order thinking skills. And we can help our students learn this language by establishing the concept of thinking skills and how they relate to language skills. Drawing their attention to functional language patterns in reading and listening texts. Training learners to recognize text types and the language patterns found in them. Providing them with sentence frames to support them in using this language. And providing tasks that offer practice using and expressing uh, these thinking skills. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for that, Nadine. Um, as always, uh, you know, if you've been to one of Nadine's webinars uh, in the past, you'll know that not only does she give a huge amount of background uh, behind the theory, the educational theory, but you also come out with all these tasks and tips that you can take back into the classroom. So that was fantastic. Thank you very much, Nadine. Uh, do we have any questions? We have a couple of minutes, so maybe two minutes. Uh, if anybody has any questions for Nadine, you can pop them in the chat box or the Q&A box. I saw at the beginning of the webinar, somebody asked about uh, certification and yes, we will be compiling certificates this week. So if you've been to this webinar or any of our previous webinars, you will get a certificate for that specific webinar uh, by the end of this week. Uh, so if we have any questions, we still have time to answer them. Um, if you don't have any questions, I would uh, love to see you on our Facebook Live this Thursday at 1 p.m. GMT. So you can uh, come and join us there, ask further questions on this webinar, um, and you can also connect with us if you're interested in our teacher training courses. You can go, uh, you can email info at atcireland.ie. You can uh, contact, sorry, you can connect with us at eltconnect.com, which is uh, the blog that is run by Aoife McLaughlin, who is our Director of Studies in Bray, and she has a huge amount of content up there. This webinar will be posted there this week, and all the previous webinars are posted there. It's a, a really good resource for lesson plans, articles, webinars, and it's where you can sign up uh, in the future. So we got some uh, really nice uh, comments in. Thank you so much uh, for your lovely comments. Thank you, Maria and Rosella. Um, that's fantastic. Thank you, Colette. Thank you, Orla. Lovely to see Orla again here. Um, can I just come in there, Joanne? Just to, yeah. just to say to uh, Maria, um, she said she couldn't make it from the very beginning, uh, but she can, if she wishes, watch this again. Um, as Joanne said, it will be up here at uh, eltconnect.com if she wish, wishes to watch it from the beginning. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So we, we will have it up this week. It'll go up um, in the next couple of days and you'll get a certificate of attendance. And the next webinar, next week, the 30th of March, I, uh, we can't believe it's the 30th of March already, I will be talking about um, special educational needs and how you can approach your lessons that make them inclusive for everybody. So not just your students with additional needs, but all the students in your class. So um, I will be here from 10 a.m. and again, 2 p.m at GMT, and you can sign up through eltconnect.com. Uh, thank you again to Nadine, absolutely wonderful webinar, full of great information, and we will uh, see you all on Thursday and hopefully again next week on Tuesday. Thanks everyone. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye.